I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. I'm delighted to, jo to welcome our guest today. She is the co-principal investigator of the University of Washington Center for an Informed Public. Kate Starbird, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Kate, what is the latest you can relay to our audience about the state of disinformation in the wake of Donald Trump being removed from several platforms and also the QAnon cohort being removed from a number of platforms. We know that the disinformation network still exists, but now that those rather drastic decisive actions were taken um, years after they were first really warranted, um, where does that leave us today? I think there's a little bit of uncertainty about uh, what comes next. Certainly we have seen the platforms begin to take action against uh, the super spreaders of misinformation and especially disinformation. And I think a lot of us kind of applaud those steps. We might think they came a little bit late. We might have wanted them to, to apply those steps uh, across maybe a larger range of accounts, but um, certainly we, we've seen some um, productive action for the larger, the so larger social media platforms. However, we're also seeing some really interesting dynamics where, where people are moving to sort of the long tail of alt tech platforms and beginning to reestablish their activities there. And certainly um, it, it, when we think about the spread of, of mis and disinformation and the growing sort of uh, radicalization uh, of, of large numbers of people around conspiracy theory ideologies and other kinds of things, um, what we may be witnessing is a shift from that happening on, on the larger platforms to these alt tech platforms. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of uncertainty and open questions about what comes next, but certainly um, we, do, we do see some, some positive change in terms of the platforms addressing that part of the disinformation uh, problem. So we saw during the insurrection, during the violence on Capitol Hill, that there were alternative platforms that you're mentioning, Gab is one of them, um, that are alternatives to your Twitter, your Facebook. Um, and now you see the formation of an app like Clubhouse, um, which so far has been issuing exclusive invitations to people, but not really assessing any kind of credentials about whether they're engaged in information sharing or disinformation or misinformation. Uh, so on the one hand, you have those platforms like Gab that are associated with the alt-right or disinformation and, and extremism and even domestic terrorism. And then you see something like a clubhouse come along, which hasn't delineated those lines yet. Um, how would you compare kind of these two different versions of emerging, um, emerging technology? Yeah, there's always, you know, there's always a period when a, a new technology, especially social media, kind of comes into being where... Um, the initial communities that meet up there and the norms that form around those communities shape the future of those platforms and what they look like. Uh, and they can go a lot of different directions. It really depends on who shows up on your platform and what you want to do about moderation. And, and so it's kind of a, an interplay between the platform's decisions that they make and the communities that begin to establish themselves on, the, on those platforms. And certainly there's a lot of different opportunity for a platform like Clubhouse. There's a lot of different directions for, for that to go. And in fact, there'll be many communities um, probably establishing themselves there uh, as we've seen in other places. So um, yeah, no, I, I think there's a lot of, um, again, you know, a, a lot of different possibility uh, for where things are going um, as these platforms uh, begin to develop and certainly um, there's some things we can learn in the past about how they've been used and, and there's some things that we might expect to see. I mean, what, what we continuously see around um, sort of the, the radicalization problem and the spread of disinformation is that a lot of organizing happens on these, in these sort of niche areas and more private conversations where they kind of uh, plan what they're going to do and then they bring that over into the more mainstream platforms to reach larger, larger audiences to recruit new people. And so there's an interplay. We can't think about activity online is happening here or there. It's happening across these different platforms. And, and when we see disinformation campaigns and these sort of like efforts to radicalize people, these are cross-platform efforts and they're using platforms in complementary ways to achieve their goals. Isn't the problem that as the parlors and the gabs and the clubhouses spring up, 
that there's still not a regulatory framework in place to address the disinformation crisis of this last decade? Yeah, I, I think there is a growing consensus that, um, that we don't have a set of guidelines or a framework to guide, you know, to guide these platforms. In some cases, the platforms have said, oh, we, we, we don't want to be the arbiters of truth. We want some, some guidance. In others, I, I think, um, you know, they might be resistant to that. So legally, uh, in the United States, there doesn't seem to be anything to hold uh, these platforms to account. They can make their choices. The fact that, that Twitter and Facebook are now choosing to act on, act on misinformation and disinformation, that's their choice. They don't have to. There, there's no legal obligation for them to, to make any changes. And so um, certainly, if, we, if we're just looking at disinformation or radicalization as a singular problem, then you know a regulatory framework, okay, for you know guidelines on, on what's allowed and what's not allowed. Now we have to balance that against freedom of speech in sort of our not only our values but our, our legal commitments to that. And and I think there's a lot of um, a, a lot of unanswered questions on how we're going to bring those together for some kind of set of guidelines that may that may um, help us shape healthier uh, information spaces going forward. So from the research that you do at the lab at the University of Washington, what would be the most effective way to approach and for this new Congress and administration to approach reforming big tech, um, specifically developing standards of community and information gathering so that there can be integrity uh, or at least there can be the credentialing of integrity to understand whether something has been vetted or not? This is such a, <laughs> this is a hard and open question and I'm not gonna pretend to say that I know all the answers in, in, in terms of like what should, what should come next and how it's gonna work. I think there are, you know, value trade-offs that need to be addressed. There are economic, you know, the, to, to do moderation on something like YouTube, YouTube is a cesspool for, for disinformation. It just, it goes there and it, and it, it contaminates other sites because it, it, it serves as a resource for campaigns that continue sort of leveraging these videos and bringing them back into conversations over and over again. And, and yet, you know, it's actually a, a, a very difficult task for that platform to be able to moderate that content and to be able to find, you know, even if they had policies that they were applying, it'd be very hard for them to enforce those policies based on just like it's too much content and we don't have the sort of um, automated tools that can effectively do that work. And so um, to think about the trade-offs between these economic models that currently, you know, these, uh, uh, these platforms make money because they don't have to moderate at scale. And what, what would it mean to have guidelines that force them to moderate at scale? Well, that would mean that perhaps some of the big platforms could pull it off but certainly it might, it might quash some of the new platforms from being able to emerge. And, and so I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work we need to do to, to work out what, what would be fair, not only in terms of holding the big uh, platforms to account, but also to enable new platforms to emerge and, and not just sort of like solidify the power that the big platforms already have by, by making a regulatory framework that basically, you know, pushes out emergent platforms. So um, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult problem. But what's also a problem, Professor, is that the monopoly players like the Facebook and Alphabet of the world and of the, the American digital landscape, um, they think they can just restart political ads after an act of terrorism that could be repeated because nothing has changed systemically on their platforms to prevent that from being the ground zero of domestic terror mobilization. So I just think it's absolutely myopic and uh, regrettable for these platforms to think, oh, we can restart, you know, ins insurrection's over, we can restart the political ad making on our platforms. Yeah, I mean, we can look at a lot of the decisions that have been made by a platform like Facebook over the last four to six years uh, and, and, and say, okay, maybe you're within the legal you know, your legal obligations, but certainly your moral and ethical obligations and uh, are not necessarily being met by some of the actions that you're taking. Um, we can talk about that on, on political ads. We can talk about that on allowing uh, accounts that they knew were spreading mis and disinformation and other harmful information that was in violation of their policies, but they didn't want to be accused of being politically biased, so they allowed those accounts to continue. Um, and there are other cases that we can see, you know, of, uh, you know, repeatedly sort of 
ignoring, downplaying the, the impact that they had in, in 2016 in terms of allowing mis and disinformation from a foreign power, and then in 2020 allowing a domestic disinformation campaign to just you know, flourish on, on, their, on their public pages and <laughs> on their groups and, 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 and further in their um, ecosystem. So um, yeah, I mean, there's, it's not even just the fact that they're monopolizing, it's the fact that they, I mean, they have this immense amount of power on a global scale in terms of shaping discourse and, and, and seems to be, um, we have pretty good evidence that there's some, some relationship to, the, to, to this platform and the rise of sort of right wing populism and some radicalization and authoritarianism in different kinds of places. I mean, Maria Reyes has been screaming about this for, for years, since 2014 or 2015, about how Facebook is basically allowing for the establishment of authoritarian uh, governments that, that use propaganda and, and disinformation to silence critics. And so, you know, they, they, they know there's a problem there. And I think, you know, if we, we start thinking about their ethical and moral obligations, if they care about democracy and they care about, you know, it, the values that, that we share, you know, democratic values, um, certainly they're, the, a lot of the actions that they're taking are not upholding those values. Kate, within the very flawed system that we have today, how do you suggest de-radicalizing so that democratic discourse itself can be viable? Yeah, this is such a hard, I mean, they're all hard questions. In terms of the, what the research says is, De-radical, you know, radicalization online. There's a lot of like, okay, the algorithms are, are you know, the algorithms seem to have something to do with the recommendation systems, um, the networks. You can see how people are becoming radicalized. There's no like, here's the way we're de-radicalizing people in online spaces. So these tools turn out to be really good for radicalization and and not offer much in terms of helping people de-radicalize. So what is it going to mean to start bringing people who are increasingly living in very disparate realities? back together in some sort of shared understanding of the world and some kind of common ground. And it doesn't seem like the platforms are designed to do that. They're designed to have us pull apart and, and become isolated and, 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 and focused on ideas that we agree with and yelling at things that we don't agree with, but it's not, they don't really seem to, to afford a lot of constructive conversations and the building of common ground and, and the de-radicalization, like the pulling people back from the rabbit hole is not something that these platforms seem to be good at. Uh, so I really think we're going to have to look further, uh, bro more broadly in society in terms of how and how we might go about de-radicalization or just like bringing people back together. I think it's going to be in personal relationships. I think it's going to be, you know, in intense conversations with family members and loved ones who, as frustrated as we might be, like somehow having to keep those pathways open to start um, to start kind of building common ground. And I think, you know, somehow these platforms are going to have to cut off. Um, some of these pathways that are continually bringing, you know, bringing people down and, and, uh, and, and, and pushing them into these echo chambers. Um, I am not particularly confident that, that something like this is around the corner. I think we're in for some hard times in terms of, you know, um, the polarization and the radicalization. Um, however, I'm hopeful. I mean, I do think, you know, a, lo a lot of people are coming to recognize this is a problem. Um, and, and I'm hopeful that we can collectively find some solutions. If you were just to think of the digital topography, if you will, or infrastructure of Web 1.0, 2.0, and let's say the social media context of today is 3.0, um, are you someone who would contend that the, the viciousness and, and even the, the hotbed of um, bigotry and um, you know, criminal organizing that is online today has not necessarily multiplied since the 90s, but is just more visible thanks to the Twitters and Facebooks basically making their common denominator, you know, what the water cooler public arena is interested in amplifying those voices. Um, is your sense that there were just as many people using the internet not for good in the 90s and the 2000s as there or the 10s as there as there are today it's just more visible to us i i mean as more and more people come online and people begin to recognize opportunity um whether it is to to do good in the world or whether it is to exploit people for their own benefit um we you know we can see escalation of things and 
Um, so we have probably more people accessing these tools. They're sharing techniques. They're beginning to recognize new opportunities. So, you know, I would say there's, there's more explo exploitation out there. There's also my dissertation was looking at online volunteerism during disaster events to help people. There's more of that too, right? Because people can come together in new ways and they can organize and they can, you know, try to help people halfway across the world from their, from their living rooms. So, you know, yeah, there's, there's more, uh, more probably of, of both. Um, yeah, I mean, we've known since the 1960s, we researchers have known, I, I wasn't alive, but um, since the 1960s that, uh, that online conversations, conversations that are mediated through computers can, can go in directions that in-person conversations wouldn't. It can, you know, flame wars happen, there can be bullying and these kinds of things. People are not always their best selves when, we've, when we remove the, the visual. Well, we think that's why. Um, you know, fast, fast forward, we have so many people doing so much of our interaction in these online spaces. The norms that we've seen just about, we can watch online norms change over time, right? So the norms that we can see develop uh, are, 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 are new. They're, they're, they have to do with how people are interacting in this world that is, you know, often textually mediated, where we're not having a lot of, you know, feedback from the other people that were there in terms of visual feedback. And so, we're developing new norms and how and how we interact and those norms are increasingly if, if we watch January 6 those internet norms are now manifesting in physical spaces. Um, with how people present themselves to the world and what actions they take in the world, and so we have to really think about um, this as a you know th this is a profound difference, we might call it a problem in society right now, because, you know, the ways that we interact are being changed by these by these tools and these tools allow for some really dark things. How do you think the pandemic has exacerbated that? Or on the other hand, as you're pointing out, more people transforming their lives through the internet and its constructive use of technology. Uh, but there's probably a way statistically to magnify the huge import, you know, importation of uh, new users since the pandemic started. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh being my research comes from the crisis space right and so we initially started studying you know how people organize online during crisis events crisis events always sort of occasion people doing new things in new ways um and and, and as well as improvising with old tools and um so historically we saw a crisis event happen and people would adopt technology for the first time for for some reason here we have like a pandemic that's causing us not to be able to interact in person and doing more and more of our interaction online. And in some ways it's been fantastic because it would have been very, very isolating to not be able to do some, in fact, our, our economies would have shut, shut down, right? We wouldn't have been able to work in the way that we figured it out in this pandemic. So that part's been great, but it's also, you know, brought a lot of people together in online spaces during a time of uncertainty and anxiety when we're actually really vulnerable to misinformation and vulnerable to manipulation. And, um, and, and it allowed people to develop new connections and new affinities between you know, people who are worried about government overreach and people that are worried about vaccines have been able to connect in new ways and, and, and recruit new people into their, into their uh, ideologies. And in some ways, I think the online activity has limited our response to the pandemic because uh, it's become a huge vector for misinformation and for people um, to, to get a false understanding of what's going on, to turn away from, from, from the official voices that were trying to help us take action that was going to be collectively helpful and um, instead, you know, kind of radicalize us into, in, in, in some ways and people, you know, kind of rejecting the, the, the knowledge that we had about the disease and, and not necessarily taking the actions that, that help themselves and their communities stay, stay, stay safe. Kate, what are some transformations within the research that you do that can help better identify the motivations of people when they're behaving online? You refer to the anonymity problem, which has been illuminated through comment section after comment section of website. It speaks to the truth, which is the wild west of the Twitter and Facebook era, unchecked, was those comment sections um, run amok uh, destructively often. So what are some ways when we know that the polling for our political campaigns in many states and in many elections is not always honest or reflective of the reality on the ground, how have you all kind of modulated or recalibrated uh, to consider the most effective ways to do research on internet users? 
Yeah, I mean, I think when we look at the research on internet users, you have to really, to get a good view, you have to look at multiple, look at the phenomenon from multiple perspectives. Now, whether that's in one research group or whether that's, you know, you're looking at a phenomenon, one paper from this group and one paper from that group and one paper from another group, because they all use different methods. I think to really understand what's going on, um, we do a lot of di digital trace uh, work. So we're actually using the, the tweets and the posts and the comments and the blogs and trying to make sense of that both like at scale using, you know, quantitative things and visualizations and, um, and also qualitative research, like looking very deeply at this content. Others might, might want to interview the people that are producing this to get a kind of a, a perspective of, of, of how they are approaching things. It's often really hard to get people to do those interviews, but I mean, you, we want to look at that, that kind of complementary perspective as well. But even it, it, our view of the digital trace data, we know is extremely biased because, you know, there are people not using these platforms. People are using different platforms that we can't see. There's all these kinds of um, invisibilities based on, you know, constraints on, on access to data. And so I think the, the really important thing is to put in these complementary perspectives and to not, iso not think we're isolating social media activity as a particular focus, but to understand that it's blended into mainstream media, cable news, you know, much larger information ecosystem and to kind of understand this interconnectedness um, using, uh, using diverse sort of perspectives into the phenomenon. In your mind, Kate, what has been the most effective study that has intersected the technical with the emotional, the human emotions here, this, really the social psychology? Because, um, you know, I haven't seen any landmark work in connection with the current political environment. Um, Kathy Kramer at the University of Wisconsin did some extraordinary work in communities, in focus groups in rural Wisconsin to understand what motivates folks uh, and how they arrive at kind of their connection from the personal intimate position or posture and their public policy positions. Uh, I'm just wondering as we conclude here what's been the most effective way to, to get at that, right? To get at the human experience on the side of the keyboard and the psychology of that person. <laughs> to be honest right now, where I learned the most about that intersection has been through the journalism of, you know, for a few really great uh, reporters who are on the mis and disinformation beat who have been able to actually kind of delve into these spaces and then talk to the people and interview the people that are experiencing um, some of this radicalization and, and or having their family members experience this radical, radicalization. Um, the research may be coming. Uh, the journalist, journalism is able to get out there a little bit faster. Um, but, but right now, you know, if you think about the field of disinformation studies, it's very new, it's very interdisciplinary. We have psychology, sociology, computer science, um, information science, these different kinds of things. Um, our group has been particularly successful because we use a mixed method approach on big social data. So we've been able to really kind of look at the trace data and, and gain some understanding from that. But when I, when I learn a lot um, outside of our, our group's work, it's often from, from people that are interviewing um, the individuals that are having these experiences. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done there, but I haven't seen the landmark study that brings it all together. And I'm not sure we're gonna have a landmark study that brings it all together. I think what we're gonna have is a bunch of different kinds of studies that approach the problem from different perspectives. And then we begin to gain this holistic understanding of what the heck is going on. Finally, for our viewers and listeners who are interested in your space, how, how can they follow your research? Um, you can uh, tune in to the Center for an Informed Public. We have, you know, Twitter accounts and, um, uh, you know, web page that we keep updated. And then my Twitter account, I do a lot of tweeting. Um, I've been studying Twitter for way too long and so have spent too much time on the platform. But um, it's a place where I, I make a lot of connections um, to other uh, journalists and academic researchers. And um, we try to put our work out uh, through that venue when we can. And, um, and uh, otherwise, I have a web page with lots of papers if you want to read it, but we also try to put out blogs and medium posts to make that more accessible to a broader public. Kate Starbird of the University of Washington, thank you so much for your insight today. All right, thank you again for having me on. Of course. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming.
Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Anne Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.